Today we will discuss torts. Let's see what is a tort. According to section 420 of the Civil and Commercial Code, a person who willfully or negligently unlawfully injures the life, body, health, freedom, property, or any other right of another person is bound to compensate him for any damage. What does it mean? Whoever is injured by the behavior or by action of another person is entitled to seek compensation. Let's make an, an example. I'm driving my car while I am using my phone. I'm not careful. I hit your car. As a result, your car is broken. What happened next? Well, I may be liable for wrongful act. I may be liable for tort. If you can prove that the following five elements are met. Act, misconduct, unlawfulness, causation and damage. I hit your car. This means that there is an action. Also, I am wrong. There is misconduct because I was negligent. I was not careful. I was not paying attention. While I was driving, I was using my phone. My action is unlawful. I had no right to hit your car. There is also a link of causation. Your car is broken because of my negligence. I am the cause of the accident. And last, damage. Your car is broken. This is the damage. So let's analyze one by one these five elements. We have to start from the general rules. As I mentioned before, the first point is act. There must be an action. This act can be positive or negative. Positive means doing something. I hit your car. This is a positive act. Commission. I have done something against you. The behavior of a person doing an act. Or to take another example, I hit you, you go to the hospital. There is a positive act. I am doing something against you. Sometime, however, I may be liable for my negative act, for my omission. I did not do something that I was supposed to do. Suppose that I am working as a waiter in a restaurant. I mop the floor without putting any sign, slippery floor. Then you walk inside my restaurant and you fall down. In this case, I am liable because I did not do something I was supposed to do. Similarly, if I work as a supervisor in a swimming pool for children, I don't pay attention. I am playing with my phone and one child dies in the swimming pool. It will be my fault. I was supposed to save the child. This is the first element. A second element is misconduct. Misconduct may be willful misconduct or negligent misconduct. Willful means I do something on purpose. The wrongdoer, the person who commits the tort, the wrongful action, desire to cause the effects of the injury. Like in the example, I hit you. We have a fight and I decide to punch you. In that case, this is willful misconduct. I desire to cause the effects of the injuries. I decide to break someone else's nose. The case would be different if I break your nose as a consequence of an accident. I am very excited because my favorite football team has won the World Cup. Then I jump, I stretch my arms and I hit you. Because of my negligence, your nose is bleeding. I will still be liable, but in this second example, the wrongdoer, me, I commit an offense unintentionally, but without the degree of care that I should have used. So how can we determine negligence? We should compare my behavior with the behavior of a reasonable person. 
a person in that specific situation? How would a normal person, a reasonable person, behave in that situation? If my behavior is not reasonable, if I am not careful, then I have to pay for my mistakes. I have to pay for my negligence. So we need to compare case by case. The outcome may be different depending on how old am I. When did the accident happen? It was during the day, during the night? It depends on the situations as well, the existing circumstances. Suppose I drive my car during the night, I cannot see a pedestrian and I hit the pedestrian. Was I negligent or not? Well, it depends on many different elements. We need to check if there was enough light. We have to check if I was running fast or not. It depends on many circumstances. The outcome would probably be different if I am driving my car during the day and then I hit a pedestrian. During the day, I have to be very careful. I have to see everybody in the street. During the night, it may happen that there is not enough illumination. I drive my car in a very careful way, but I hit someone. This may not be my fault. A third element is unlawfulness. We need to determine whether the tort feeser has violated a particular law or, more in general, has caused injuries that he had no authority to inflict to another person. So, if I punch you, I have no reason to behave like that. If I break your nose, I must pay for the consequences of my actions. However, the outcome would be different if you provoke me or you were trying to steal my wallet. Well, in that case, I try to protect myself, I try to protect my money, and then I may hit you. Similarly, if you break down in my house during the night, you have a gun. I see you are inside my house with a gun and I shoot you. Well, in that case, my behavior is not unlawful. In this case, I will not held liable for harm that I have caused. This is called justifiable act. The fourth element is causation. What is causation? The victim must show that the wrongdoer's breach of duty caused the victim's injury. There must be a link between the wrongdoer's act and the damage. So to take the example I mentioned before, if I hit your car, your car will be broken as a consequence of my action. Under the law, we have two types of causation. First, we have to prove that my action was the material cause of the damage. What does it mean? It means that the reason why your car is broken is directly related to my action. I was driving too fast, I hit your car. I am the material cause of the damage. However, there may be many material causes, like for example, the person in the car who was talking with me, I was not pay paying attention. I was not careful because I was talking with someone else in the car. The passenger in the car is the material cause as well of the damage. Similarly, the seller of the car is also considered to be the material cause. If the seller did not sell the car to me, I would never hit your car. So there may be many, many material causes. This is why it is important to narrow down this criteria by using a second criteria for receivability. What does it mean? It means that the wrongdoer is responsible only if you can prove that the damage would have been foreseeable, predictable by a person of reasonable care. Now, it is predictable that if I am driving my car 
while I am talking with someone else, I may have an accident. I may hit your car. On the contrary, it is not foreseeable that if I sell my car to you, you will hit another car. The accident is not predictable. I cannot foresee in advance that I will sell you the car, you will talk in the car with someone else and then you will not be careful and you will eat another car. This is not foreseeable, this is why the car seller will not be liable for the accident. Fifth element is damage. A damage must have occurred. If we have the four elements I mentioned before, act, misconduct, unlawfulness, causation, but there is no damage. Well, in that case, there is no tort, no wrongful act has been committed. So let's see in more detail what is a damage. Damage may be a personal damage, like for example, if I spill hot coffee on your legs, this would be personal damage. The coffee is very hot, you may need to go to the hospital as a consequence of my action. Property damage would be the damage to the trousers. You need to buy new trousers. So one action may lead to two different types of damages. Personal damage, property damage. I drive my car too fast, I hit you, I break your car, you have to go to the hospital. Personal damage and property damage at the same time. Also we have violation of protective statutes in case of action which may have impact on other interests. This can be the case of economic loss. To make an example, suppose that a commission unlawfully decides to reject a candidate's application for a highly competitive and potentially permanent job. Since the commission does not cause a direct damage to the candidate's property or person, the damage is called economic loss. It is important to point out that case law has established that if there is consent of the victim, then the result is not considered as a damage. Suppose I ask you to punch me or I ask you to hit my car on purpose. Well, in this case, if there is agreement from the victim, there is no wrongful act, no tort has been caused. In terms of damage compensation, the calculation may be different depending on the type of damage. In case of defamation, section 423 of the Civil and Commercial Code states that any person who, contrary to the truth, says something which is injurious to the reputation of another person, must pay compensation for the damage. So if I say my student sells drug and this is not true I must pay compensation for the resulting damage. Bodily harm is regulated under different rules. If I cause a wrongful act I cause bodily damages. In this case I must pay compensation for all the medical expenses as well as other expenses total and partial disability to work, the victim cannot go to work for a period of time, lose part of his salary for a period of time, also third party for loss of the injured party services. For instance, suppose that I am a famous architect and I agree with my client to design a new innovative commercial center in Bangkok. If you hit me with your car, my client may sue you for loss of profit. I cannot work for my client anymore. My client may sue you for the loss of the services. And the last point, non-pecuniary damages. Such damages are not defined in the Civil and Commercial Code in a clear way. However, we can define this type of damages as damages which cannot be measured by money and cannot be defined in objective and standard terms, such as 
pain, suffering, violation of privacy, disfigurement, disability, and loss of enjoyment. Each category of non-pecuniary damages can be claimed separately. So, for example, you can claim four different types of damages. Expenses, total disability to work, and non-pecuniary damages. In case of death, the defendant can claim funeral or other necessary expenses. Let's say that in the car accident, you kill my uncle. Then I may sue you for the funeral expenses. You have to pay for his funeral. If he did not die immediately, you may need to pay for the ambulance and for all other medical expenses which are related to his death. And then, as we saw before, third party for loss of the legal support and victim services. So, for example, the, the son of my uncle may sue you because they are minors, they do not have any income after the death of their father, they may decide to sue you for loss of legal support. Let's see now some specific cases, specific situations in civil liability. Some type of torts, they are under a presumption of fault. What does it mean? As a general rule, if I sue you, I have to prove that I'm right, I have to prove that you are wrong. However, in these different situations, under a presumption of fault, the rule is the opposite. I sue you, I don't have to prove anything, you have to prove that you were right, you have to prove that you were not wrong. This apply for the violation of protective statutes if the damage results from an infringement of a statutory provision intended for the protection of others. Copyright infringement, for example. Then, in case of liability for damage caused by animals. Your dog bites me. I don't have to prove that you took reasonable care of your dog. I sue you I need to show evidence that I have been beaten by your dog, then you have to prove that you took good care of your animal, that you took care of your dog in order to avoid liability. Another case is supervisor's liability. Supervisor is liable for the wrongful acts of his supervisee, provided that it can be proved that he has not exercised proper care. This applies to teachers, employer, or other person who undertakes the supervision of a person without capacity. So there is a joint liability with such person. Suppose that a 14-year-old boy decides to bring firecrackers to school. The teacher, after seeing him playing in the classroom, tells him to stop. Without taking the firecrackers away, the child doesn't care about the teacher, plays with the firecrackers and accidentally blinds one of his friends. Well, in this case, the teacher would be liable because the teacher did not exercise proper care during his job. Another case of presumption of fault is parents and guardians liability. If a minor commits a wrongful act, the parents will be liable with him unless they can prove proper care in performing the duty of supervision. So, for example, if parents allow their 14-year-old son to ride a motorbike and then the motorbike hits me, I have the right to sue the driver as well as the parent. Then we have another case of liability, the liability of building possessor. If damage is caused by reason of defective construction of a building, the possessor of such building is bound to pay compensation unless 
he can prove that he has used proper care to prevent the damage. So I walk and the brick fall down on my head. You are the building possessor. You are automatically liable. I don't have to prove that you did not use proper care. If you don't want to pay compensation, you have to prove that you use proper care to prevent the damage. Lastly, liability for motor vehicles. This is governed under section 437 of the Civil and Commercial Code, which states that the person who is in possession of a vehicle is liable for the harm he causes unless he can prove that the injury results from force majeure or from fault of the victim. You drive a car, you hit me, you are liable, unless you can prove that the damage was caused by force majeure such as earthquake or a tsunami or fault of the victim. I jump in front of your car, it's my fault. The last part is about no-fault tort. The law in these situations does not require any fault. This is also called strict liability regime. You are liable, doesn't matter if you were negligent or not, you have to pay always. This is the case of liability of juristic person, employer's liability, agent's liability, liability of building occupier and building owner. Let's see one by one. Liability of juristic person. This means that a juristic person may be held liable for any damage done to other person by its representatives or people which are empowered to act on behalf of the person. If it is the fault of the CEO, it will be automatically the fault of the juristic person, of the company. If the CEO is working for the company, the CEO is liable, the company will be liable with the CEO. It is no fault tort. Employer's liability. In case of wrongful act which have been committed by employees, no fault liability applies, which means that the employer is liable with the employees for harm cause in the course of their employment. For example, an employer asks his employee to drive his car and pick the mail at the post office. On the way back, the employee negligently causes an accident and the man dies. In this case, the employer is liable with the employee for the accident. The next type of liability is for the agents, agents liability. The principal is liable with the agent for the torts which are committed by the agent in the execution of the agency contract. So suppose John appoints Michael as an agent to sell his hotel. While negotiating with another party, Michael falsely states that the net average profit from the hotel has been 3 million baht, but this is not true. Well, in this case, John will be liable as well. Then we have liability of building occupier. Civil and commercial code states that an occupier of a building is responsible for damage or injury occur from things which fall from the building, regardless of its cause, whether it is by negligence or willful misconduct. And the last part is about the liability of building occupier. The owner of a building or other structure must pay compensation if the damage is caused by reason of defective construction of such structure and the possessor has used proper care to prevent damage from happening. The main purpose of this section is to protect the victims from damage resulting from defective construction or insufficient maintenance of building structures. Thank you very much for watching.